But first, we want to introduce ourselves and, you know, let you know who are these weird folks up here talking. So my name is Courtney Pemberton. I actually do work with Shipple. I'm on the business development team there. So AKA sales, I'm a sales guy. Todd? Uh, my name is Todd Neenkirk. Uh, I'm with Four Kitchens in Austin, Texas. We're a small web design and development shop that focuses mainly on Drupal and building um, really large scale media sites. Uh, I am a partner, designer, and developer there, and I handle, I guess, a majority of sales and business development just as a matter of course. So we are talking about RFPs today. How many people do not know what an RFP is? Okay. Cool. Well, it's a new LOL or a new OMG. No, it's not. Um, it's a, <laughs> it, uh, it means request for proposal. And a lot of people send them to potential vendors, a lot of consultants to you know, get bids on pricing for services. And it's a, an extremely formal process. So we, we really want to talk about that today because it's an inevitable thing if you are in business, if, especially if you are a consultant, you're going to come across an RFP. And a lot of times it is a lot of time and a lot of money. And that means a lot to a business and their objectives. So it's kind of, should you do an RFP? Should you respond to them? That's why it's so important, especially if you're in business and especially if you want to make money. So. So how many people here uh, typically bid on RFPs? Like how many people here are vendors that respond to RFPs? Okay, how many people here write RFPs to solicit responses? Okay, a few of you. Um, does anybody here do both? That's what I thought. Okay, uh, and how many people here uh, believe that RFPs are fun and uh, just good, good to produce, good to respond to. Anybody here like doing that at all? Didn't think so. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so let's move on. Well, I think the first thing that we really need to understand, um, that you know, me and Todd, after talking, there's been a, a disconnect. Well, why do customers send out RFPs? There's a lot of different reasons, and it's good to know those, especially if you are a vendor. Um, so the first one is market price and leverage. Uh, leverage, that's a, that's a doozy because that oftentimes means the customer it already has a vendor and they're going out and researching other prices to use it as leverage for their current vendor. So much fun, right? So <laughs> they're shopping around. Um, again, if you are the vendor, it's a waste of your time if that's the case. Right, and it's, it's reasonable from the uh, the customer's perspective and and to define a few terms the customer f for the purposes of this presentation is the person writing the RFP and wanting to get proposals from vendors and vendors are the people who provide the services and have to respond to RFPs so that's what we mean by customer and vendor throughout mm -hmm. this presentation so it makes sense of course for the customer to want to shop around because every so often you do want to make sure that you're getting your money's worth you want to make sure that you're not being overcharged for some reason um, but it's also kind of mean. It's, it's mean when you're the vendor and you think that there's this job possibly coming down the pipe and you think, oh, this is really exciting, I'm gonna spend a lot of time working on it, when in fact, the customer has no intention of actually using your services, but instead is just gonna use that number as evidence to show their boss or to show the other vendor to get them to knock down their price. Also, they are qualifying new vendors. It, it, it's similar to you know market price. Um, but it, they're just kind of seeing what else is out there, seeing what the, you know, how the prices are now, because internet is always changing. And I say internet because I work for a web marketing company, but even consulting uh, for any large business, it's always changing. There's always something new. So pricing is always changing. So they're also going out and qualifying new vendors. This is a fun one too. <laughs> so this amounts to uh, a detailed, RFP, or rather, and a response to an RFP, a proposal, amounts to free consulting. So as the vendor, when you are looking through uh, a request for work and they say, I want to build a shopping website that does the following, uh, it's going to be like Zappos, but for uh, shoehorns instead of shoes, right? So they're building some kind of crazy thing 
And uh, they specifically asked be as detailed as possible. Part of our scoring for this proposal is going to be detail. The vendor actually starts engaging in consulting in order to just secure that job. As consultants, as vendors, we are paid for our knowledge, our experience, and our brainwaves. And any time that we're spending putting actual detail into a proposal is just money that the, uh, is, is work that the customer is not going to have to pay for down the line. Right, and, and I know there's been many times when I'm writing a proposal and I, I get detailed. I mean, I might as well be writing a book and I feel like I'm doing something great, but they could actually be taking that idea and taking that example that I showed them, just me trying to establish some kind of rapport on paper, which I don't even know if you can actually do that, but that's essentially what you're trying to do. And you know, they can just go off and use it and say, here, this is a good example. Can you build it for me, but cheaper? So we don't like those. <laughs> and that sounds cynical, but that does happen. That, that really does happen. Uh, standard procedure. You, you see this in government and also universities. They have to go through some kind of procurement process. Um, sometimes it's not up to them, but sometimes it's they already have a vendor, but because of their standard procedures, they have to get five other bids and you could possibly possibly be one of those four other bids spending you know hours upon hours just to help them in their standard procedure this happens uh Courtney mentioned um governments but this also happens a lot with universities so uh case in point university of texas at austin i used to work there um anytime we had a bid over i think it was twenty thousand dollars or a project that they anticipated would cost twenty thousand dollars or more it had to go out to bid and they had to get two competing bids. And almost every time, from my experience working there, uh, they had already chosen a vendor or they had already reached out to somebody and said, okay, we basically wanna go with you guys. We're gonna write an RFP that will pretty much guarantee that you're going to get this job. Just, you know, kind of a formality, just fill it out and we're gonna go find two suckers to do comp competing bids to fulfill some legal requirement. And because of certain specific things that only your company can provide, there's no way these other companies can get it. And obviously that's unfair to these other vendors who are going to be spending a lot of time responding to this RFP. So why do vendors respond? Well, there's really one answer, and I was guilty of this starting in business development. I was like, they want a new vendor. This is awesome, and they have this crazy big budget. I have a chance. Negative. You do not. Because, <laughs> because what you think as the vendor and then seeing all of these different reasons, I mean, there, there's more so than even what me and Todd talked about. Those objectives do not match up. It's almost a lose-lose situation from the jump. And you have to really think about, is that something you want to be a part of as a vendor? So. And responding to vendors, or responding to RFPs from a vendor's perspective is, uh, can we all agree it's the worst part of our job, right? Anybody agree? It's like doing homework. I, I really love my job except for this one thing, and that's writing proposals. I love doing the work, I love talking to clients, I love forming partnerships with people, uh, but there's this homework aspect. So it's like being back in school and you're like, well, you know, biology can be fun when we're doing neat stuff, but then, you know, there's all this homework. And the homework is just such a drag, and you put it off, and you put it off, and you put it off, and you don't want to talk to the client about it because it's just the worst thing in the world to try and do. So. Vendors, even though you know, we could be naive, even though we really need the money and we want the projects and we want to do all this work, uh, we hate doing it. And the customer's reasons for issuing an RFP don't at all align with the vendor's reasons for responding to it. Very rarely is there a customer that has a, a project that requires an RFP uh, that is totally above board, uh, that isn't also mandated by some kind of law or regulation or something that says you have to go out to bid. So there is a huge mismatch here between what the customer is trying to get out of this and what the vendor is trying to do. So do we think RFPs are a waste of time? I think that is obvious from our standpoint up here. And wait, well, we do. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Right. I know, maybe it's later. Anyways. Um, 
I don't want to say that's the end all be all answer. And so what me and Todd want to get into right now is kind of why it makes sense for us at our own companies where we work or we go through this situation every single day. Um, so first, you know, as I said earlier, I, I work at Shipple. I'm in sales, so I do get presented with RFPs. Um, even, gosh, last year we were hunting them down. I mean, we wanted to see what was out there and the kind of companies that were requesting, um, you know, our kind of work. But for Shipple, you know, a background of our company, to gain uh, some perspective, we're a shop of 37 people. Um, we focus on web design, web development, SEM, social media. Um, we have dedicated teams. So, you know, a l large projects, they, they obviously have a lot of different uh, people working on them. It's not just one person. Um, we are high volume. So on average per year, we send out about 150 projects. Um, we also, our typical timeline, three to six months, and the typical uh, project that comes in the shop is $10,000, $20,000 budget. Now, if you look at how much time we spend on RFPs, and then how uh, are the percentage of business that comes in our shop, over 60% comes from current clients or referrals. And so when you throw an RFP in the process, you really have to think about, do I want to spend my time on this basically questionnaire that's kind of, it asks the most ridiculous questions sometimes, no offense, customers, um, or do I want to contact my current clients and see, you know, do they have referrals? How are they doing with their website? It's kind of a no-brainer. So that's where we stand at Shipple, and that's kind of why, you know, I'm up here talking about that. So I'd like to give a, a quick um, uh, profile of Four Kitchens because we, um, we're quite a bit different uh, from Shipple, actually. So we are a 12-person company. We are a third the size of Shipple. Uh, we focus exclusively on web design and development. We don't do any marketing. So there's no SEM, no um, uh, marketing or, or sales or uh, anything like that. We do the design, the UX, the theming, uh, and the development. We do not have a dedicated sales team. Uh, I am one of three people that makes sales decisions at the company. It's me and my partner and our project manager and director of client relations. We do very, very low volume. We do about five projects a year as opposed to 150 projects a year. But our average project budget is a quarter of a million dollars. So we're dealing with very, very few, very large projects at any given time. Typical timeline is at least six months. That's a very short project for us. That is a quickie. Usually our projects last two years. Our longest running project is four years, and it's still going. So we spend about twice the amount of time on our proposals. We spend 30 to 40 hours per RFP. So that's one person spending their entire week responding to an RFP. And that doesn't even uh, include the time spent building all the marketing materials that we just drop into this stuff, all the boilerplate, all of the sales materials and the templates and all of these things that we put together weeks or years ago. Uh, this is fresh. When we get an RFP and we start the timer running, uh, all of that, we spend 30 to 40 hours on that particular proposal. And 85% of our work over the past five years involved no RFP whatsoever. That means that only 15% of all of the work that we've done in the last five years required any kind of pr uh, proposal in response to an RFP. So our RFP is actually good for business. Obviously, we don't think so. I think so. <clears throat> so there <laughs> is, there's an exercise you can do to figure it out, and that's how we arrived at the numbers we did earlier. So if you'll remember, Shippel, 60% uh, of the business required no RFP, essentially, or as a repeat business, 80% at Four Kitchens. Um, 10 to 30 hours, I think it was? Yeah, 10 to 20. 10 to 20 hours per response, 30 to 40 hours per response. At Four Kitchens, uh, here's, here's why we're giving this presentation. Uh, at Four Kitchens, a few months ago, uh, we had the good fortune of teaming up with Happy Cog to go in on a proposal. And uh, Happy Cog, if you don't know, is like this amazing uh, design firm uh, located uh, everywhere. They're, by the way, uh, for a little bit of Texas pride, they're moving their San Francisco offices to Austin uh, at the end of this year. Uh, so they are located in Philadelphia, uh, Austin, formerly San Francisco as well. Um, people like Jeffrey Zeldman work for Happy Cog, you know, one of the creators of web, the web as we know it, essentially. 
um, we were uh, really, really thrilled to uh, receive a call from them saying, hey, you guys know Drupal, right? Uh, we have this project with a big state. There's a big state agency that needs a big Drupal platform, and it's a huge RFP, but it's really, really nasty. And we, Happy Cog, uh, we really, really hate responding to RFPs. And this light bulb went off in our head. Like, somebody just said they don't like responding to RFPs, and they actually generally don't. So Happy Cog's uh, uh, stance was they are RFP averse, and they don't uh, typically answer any kind of RFPs whatsoever. And we thought at first that's suicide, and then immediately afterwards that's awesome, and that's exactly what we should be doing. So we did the numbers. And we got up on a big whiteboard in a meeting room and we listed every client that we successfully won or really wanted to win over the past five years. And of all the numbers that we put up on the screen, and I have them here, uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, more than 80% uh, required no RFP. They walked in the door or it was word of mouth or they had seen something that we'd done and they just wanted to get started right away because they were more interested in developing a partnership than having some kind of a competitive bid process. We had responded to, uh, again, low volume, 18 RFPs in the past five years. So imagine 30 to 40 hours being spent on each of those 18. Of those 18, we won four. That's 22%. So 15% of our business, roughly, correlated to 22% of RFPs that we responded to, which is to say negligible. So we thought, how much money are we actually losing? So we took the 30 to 40 hour estimate per proposal, we multiplied that by the 14 that we did not get, the 14 proposals we submitted that we did not get. That is anywhere between $75,000 and $125,000 that we lost in people spending time writing RFPs as opposed to working on projects over the past five years. That's enough money to kind of make you sick. You know, $100,000 or more, just gone, just vanished because we didn't have people to do that work. We could have been doing other work instead. Uh, it, it would have been cheaper to fly two to three people per proposal to do an in-person pitch and get to know the client than it was to fill out a piece of paper and submit it to them. Kind of crazy, right? But it's true. So you need to do the numbers for your own company and figure out if you're wasting time. As a result of that meeting and sitting down and writing all that stuff on the board and looking at all the numbers, we decided that Four Kitchens will generally also not respond to RFPs ever again. So you should first figure out what percent of RFP-driven proposals do you actually win? So you, know, you do 10 a year, 20 a year, 100 a year. How many are you actually getting as a result of all that work? What percentage of work that you get does not involve any kind of RFP whatsoever? What is repeating business, or they walk in the door, or it's word of mouth, or they just want to get started, or something? And then how much time are you spending on each of these RFPs? And what does that correlate to in, in terms of uh, your hourly rate or your average project size? Uh, there are a number of other downsides to RFPs. Courtney? Thank you. So statistics and data like that, I mean, it's, it's hard facts and it's real facts and it's real facts that affect business and, you know, four kitchens making money, you know, that they actually lost. So, but there's also some other downsides of RFPs. Um, of course, we mentioned this a little bit er earlier that you're giving away free work and you have to value your time. It's not free. You know, you're hired at your company for a reason because you provide value and in no way, sh shape or form should you give 10 to 20 hours of your time and your knowledge for free if they're just going to take it and use it elsewhere. So that's something that I was naive about, you know, just like the earlier slide, vendors I na are naive. I was one of them. I was like living in La La Land, Candyland and thinking that they really wanted to do work with me. That's not yeah, the case. It's one of those, you know, they like me, they really like me, they sent me an RFP. Like, no, you're a name on a mailing list, and we should accept that. Wrong way. There we go. This is a big one, um, especially if you're a creative agency. An RFP, it takes all of the creative 
um, you know, ideas that you have, probably the reason that you were actually hired at the company. It's stripping all that away and putting it down on paper in some kind of formal, you know, textbook format. And it's how are you really going to, as a customer, decide on a vendor based on a 30-page document because it's all about relationships. You're in the business of building relationships, especially for long-term growth. So that's, for me personally, stripping away our creativity, especially at Shibble, where we are crazy, and I think that's what sets us apart. It's, it's not a good thing for us at all. So uh, here's, here's a question for everybody here. How many people here have seen an RFP that says, your RFP must be in 12-point courier font one inch margins, do not exceed three pages, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> a lot of government contracts do that uh, because governments live in a grant writing universe and all grants are like that. So all grants, when I worked for UT Austin, part of my job was reviewing grants before they went out the door. Uh, but this wasn't like any, this required no intelligence whatsoever because my job was to take a ruler and measure the number of characters per line on the printed page to make sure that on average they did not exceed what was written in the RFP. That's insane, right? They were paying me to do that. I hated it. Uh, so you have these, these RFPs that have you know, weird formatting guidelines or uh, this is, uh, this is a, a creative industry. Web design is, is creative both artistically and technically. How can you possibly portray creativity in a written proposal? All that a proposal tells you is that those people are good at writing proposals. They don't say anything about their actual skill or creativity. So when we require a document and it says, just write up what you're gonna do in some document somewhere and send it off to us in triplicate, you know, overnight UPS, uh, how does that possibly convey good coding practice, security standards, uh, being easy to work with, being friendly, being uh, accommodating to changing requirements? It, it doesn't at all, right? Uh, how many people here, again, uh, produce RFPs and then have to review the uh, pr 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 proposals that come in? Anybody? Sometimes? Uh, I totally sympathize with where you're coming from because these things must be a real bore to read, right? After a while, I mean, you get past like three of them. It, has anybody here ever read people's resumes to hire them, right? <laughs> At Four Kitchens, we, uh, a year and a half ago, we needed to find a uh, operations manager. So we, you know, put up all the posts everywhere in Craigslist and we were accustomed to responses for developer positions and designer positions, which would give us between 50 and 100 responses. We got 350 resumes in two days and I had to read every single one. And by the time you get past 100, you are looking for an excuse to throw it away. This paper stuck to the other one, forget it, right? It's that bad because you just go crazy. So it's, I imagine, I have not had to read proposals and choose a vendor. I, luckily, I've never had to do that. So I do not envy this position at all. But I, I can imagine that reading through proposals is exactly like reading through a stack of 350 resumes. People are saying a lot of the same things in slightly different ways, using really you know, formal and kind of stodgy language to say like, we will maximize synergy and minimize, over, minimize uh, turnover and you know, just all this stuff that just doesn't mean anything anymore after you read it 30 or 40 times, right? So RFPs, the way they're written, because they're so restrictive in how we as vendors have to respond to them, strip out all of that creativity, which is in fact what you're trying to hire us for, right? So this is a big one you know, for, for me as well personally because my job is to meet people, build relationships with them, go out, shake their hand, and build trust, and share my knowledge, of course. So RFPs, oftentimes, they'll have stipulations in them that say, you know, you're not allowed to contact us. Well, that sucks. I mean, really? You're not allowed to contact us. I, it blows my mind every time I read that. Um, just send your questions via email. Okay. I mean, how, I, how I... How many people here project manage solely through email? It's okay. Be honest. It's okay. Raise that hand, But it Robin. sucks, right? It's the worst. You need to talk to people. Yes, you get on the phone, exactly. 
Sometimes we can't call these, these potential customers because they specifically say, don't call us. And I can understand having read through 350 resumes saying, please don't call me to talk about your resume because I will spend weeks on the phone. I understand that. But we need to be able to engage with customers in some way. Right. I mean, especially if some of these people are willing to throw down 50000 $100,000, don't you want to talk to those people that are sending you RFPs? Um, because to me, that sounds like a long-term relationship and a huge investment. So it's, it's pretty important. Oops. That's the end. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a quote that I found. And, you know, Coca-Cola, they're a pretty big deal. So uh, Ken Cardi, VP, uh, Chief Procurement Officer, he's be cost efficient or be innovative, just make sure you stand out from the crowd. And so I think that only um, you know, further explains that people are looking for you to be unique and the RFP process just does not speak to you know, that statement at all. So here are some other options. Um, I mentioned earlier that at, at Four Kitchens, we started thinking about the amount of time and money we were losing to writing these proposals and how it would be cheaper to just send people out in person to engage with the potential client. Uh, some options for dealing with RFPs when they come in the door. One, establish some kind of relationship. That can be on the phone. Uh, that could be in person. It could be an in-person pitch. But you want to engage in a conversation because what you're trying to do is create a relationship. Uh, this is not, building websites and doing this kind of high level consulting and, and lengthy work is not getting your car fixed. It's not going to a mechanic and the mechanic saying, well, you're going to need a new transmission. The parts cost $2,500 and we think it's going to take us 10 hours to put in a new one. They may be off by a couple of hours, but it's still a couple of hours that will cost you an extra $150, $200. Individually, that hurts. We don't want to see, we don't want to have to spend an additional $200 on our car. We don't want to see that we bought some part for a car that cost $2,500, right? That's a lot of money. But we're dealing with websites in the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. We need to have a relationship here. You need to trust your mechanic, right? How many people go out of their way to ask their friends to say, do you have a mechanic you trust, like somebody who's just not going to totally screw you? Can you please give me their information? That's just a car. That's just a regular maintenance cost. And some people don't engage in that conversation for a $250,000 website that will represent their company worldwide. That's crazy, right? That's crazy. Uh, we need to ask the right questions of our potential customers. We need to ask, is this an open bid? An open bid means they threw out an RFP. They probably got 100, 200 mailing list things blasted it out there or posted it publicly on their website and it got aggregated into something and somehow trickled down to you, uh, it means that they have not actually started looking at a good fit at all. They have no idea whatsoever. They're going to be getting offers from overseas. They're going to be getting uh, people who are just starting a company. And I know what that's like, so I sympathize with them, but they may not have the right experience. They're going to be getting companies like Accenture and Capgemini and IBM and these mega consulting firms that will say, oh, we don't get out of bed for less than a million dollars. Uh, but you know, we'll, you know, we'll do something else. We'll also supply you with a, uh, a bunch of vehicles for a company fleet and uh, security detail. You know, like, that's not what I want. I just want a website, so give me a website vendor. Um, we also need to talk about uh, if it's a good fit. Courtney? Well, I mean, just to go back on the open bid, that's a red flag in my eyes. That means that you are a very small fish in a very large pond, and do you want to waste your time on that? It all comes down to time and making sure that it's valuable. So I would automatically see that as a red flag, and maybe you should pass on the business. Um, but yeah, is it a good fit? So can you even do what they're asking? Are they asking ludicrous questions that, you know, I don't really think any vendor in the world would actually be able to provide for this person. So you want to make sure that is a win-win situation. We preach that all the time at Shipple. You don't have to hire everybody. Um, you don't have to take in every customer that calls you. Just like an RFP, you don't have to respond to every single RFP that comes across your way because it actually could end up losing you money in the long run even if they did come on as a client. I mean, how many people actually have clients and they've lost money on them? A lot of people. 
a lot of people. And so it's good to really assess <laughs> two hands. Woo. If, if uh, you didn't raise your hand, you're lying. <laughs> and so it's just good to ask questions. It's okay to ask questions. Um, Here, here's another question that, um, that relates to the open bid. Um, again, this is something that we started doing at Four Kitchens because even though we're so RFP averse, we do a lot of work in the higher ed space and dealing with university systems and large university bureaucracies, RFPs are a fact of life. So we still have to deal with them even though we grit our teeth and really hate every moment of it. Uh, one of the questions that we ask uh, universities as they come in the door is, please be honest with us because we're about to spend 30 to 40 hours looking over this document. We're a small company, we're 12 people. Uh, somebody will spend their entire week this week talking to you, asking questions, getting details, writing this stuff, we're gonna send it to you. Are you just looking for competitive bids? Just like knock once for yes, twice for no. You know, can we just be honest with each other here? We would really appreciate it if you would somehow signal that maybe we shouldn't respond because you really already have somebody in mind. If you can say that just honestly, two things. One, you may actually get an honest answer and then you can walk away and that will save you a lot of time because you weren't gonna get the job anyway. So it's not like you lost the RFP, you never had it to begin with. Two, uh, that kind of open dialogue reveals a lot about your personality as a vendor, as a company, as, uh, as a consultant and the right kind of client will really appreciate a question like that. And anybody who gets offended by that kind of question, you don't wanna be working with them anyway. Exactly. Uh, if we go back to the, the previous slide, yeah. the last point here that we want to make is that we should all make a pledge to take a stance against RFPs. Because if we all stop responding to them, nobody will write them, right? Yep. Can we start to stop <laughs> responding? Let's stop the madness. I'm serious, like I, I know it's funny and it's kind of, you know, like that, this guy's crazy. I have to respond to RFPs, otherwise I won't get business. If we apply enough pressure and enough resistance long enough, they will break. They will stop doing this. So is everybody here willing to try some of this stuff? A little bit? Start the revolution. All right, <laughs> this, it starts here, people. Right here, you are here. No more RFPs. Hashtag no RFPs. It's true. Yes. Exactly. So that um, so that the camera can pick it up. Um, the comment was RFPs were probably started to even the playing field, and that's true. There is definitely some old boys club stuff that goes on in certain areas. I personally don't see a lot of that in this industry because this industry is kind of new. It's very dynamic. Um, it involves a lot of. Um, different skill sets. So you have artists, you have technical people, you have engineers, you have marketing people, communications people. Uh, you have so many voices coming in. Um, I agree that RFPs are definitely like that on that mega consulting scale. So one of the things we wanted to bring up is that Schiphol, Four Kitchens, all of the other companies on this scale, you know, the, the small to mid-sized companies that do this kind of consulting, the money we get from our customers pays our paychecks. We get that money directly. They give it to us and then it goes home with us and we have families and they get to eat, right? If they're dealing with a big mega consulting firm, a Capgemini, an Accenture, something like that, a logistics consulting firm, they get some enormous bid and they basically say, just don't worry about it. We're, all your problems will be solved if you go with us. Give us $10 million. We'll make all of your problems go away. They're big, they're publicly traded, so the people who make the decision to go with that company, well, they're obviously trustworthy, they're enormous, and they'll, they're making so much extra money that if they screw up, there's a lot of buffer there to fall back on. So then these big companies, they just sub out everything. They subcontract the website, they subcontract out the vehicle, the, the fleet vehicles, the security detail, the marketing campaign, the television ads, all of that stuff is just subbed out and they scrape all of that stuff off the top because they're doing all the negotiations for you. They're doing the real, vendor building and the proposal work for you. And if you have $10 million, $100 million, or in the case of Accenture plus uh, TxDOT, Texas Department of Transportation, a billion dollars, the first billion dollar deal, uh, I think it was revoked actually, because there was such outcry over a um, thousand million dollars being given to a company. Um, it was, whatever the cost was, it was the largest public bid of its 
kind at the, at the time, five years ago. Imagine how much money they're making off of that because they sub out all of this stuff to smaller shops to do all the little detail work, right? So at a high level, RFPs are probably still necessary, will probably always exist because you're dealing with the Boeings and the Lockheed Martins and the multi-billion dollar security contracts and stuff like that, sure. But us, come on, you know, we're not Boeing. We're not Hello, Lockheed Martin. We, <laughs> the money we make that we get from our, our customers goes directly into our pocket as our paycheck. So either way you look at it, we're all in the business to make money. And so this is kind of our open letter to customers, you know, help us help you. You know, what can you do to, you know, sometimes this makes the process easier on you and it definitely saves us time and energy because we're not always a good fit for you either. So the first one right off the bat is tell us your budget. Um, we understand that this question, it comes out a lot and you might might be taken back because it's, you know, if, if I have a $100,000 budget, the vendor is definitely going to quote me $100,000. But in the case of, you know, if someone came to Shipple only having $5,000 and they went to Four Kitchens, I mean, they don't need to waste their time on that project. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. So tell us your budget from the get-go. It's We're not trying to be malicious or take your money from you. We just want to know if we're a good fit for your project. Right. And if a customer comes to us and says, um, so we want to uh, we want to build eBay, but uh, better, bettereBay.com. Um, we have ten thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it, this is my friend friend book of faces dot net. Uh, I want that. I've got ten thousand bucks. You can do this, right? Like, there's open source software. That, you know, it's free, right? Just you know, make this. Uh, knowing that their budget is ten thousand dollars, we can all say as an industry, you're crazy. This is not going to happen. That's not nearly enough money. Facebook has never turned a profit and they've sunk hundreds of millions of dollars into it, right? You're insane. So this helps the customer in that they know that this is totally unrealistic. And if anybody tells them, yeah, we can do that, they're lying. They're gonna take their money, they're gonna disappear. They're gonna offshore it, something awful is going to happen and you're gonna look like an idiot, right? So if somebody, and, and I understand that this is usually people who have to answer to shareholders or uh, bosses or somebody, the person putting together this RFP and they say, well, I can't talk about the budget. Um, if you really can't talk about the budget, what that tells us as vendors is that you want us to get into a price war. So that means we have to bid down. So we want the work, right? And we're gonna try and bid down here. There's gonna be stuff that's gonna get left out of that RFP. There's gonna be functionality that's vague, that's kind of like, we want it to be like Friendster, we want it to be like MySpace, but what they're saying is they want Facebook, but they're not saying it, right? So we get in this price war with other vendors. Uh, it's gonna be wrong, we're gonna quote the wrong price. And instead what customers should be doing is saying, I have a budget, it's $100,000. When people get married, right, they set a budget for their wedding. Uh, I have $1,000 to spend, it's gonna be a really small wedding, it's gonna be a really intimate affair, cool. I have $50,000, we're gonna have 300 people in a caterer, we're gonna have a live band. You set a budget so that you don't go above it and you do what you can do within that budget. That's what we need to know as vendors. If you tell us we have $100,000 for this project, we will do $100,000 worth of work to get you as far as we possibly can and work in a very flexible, dynamic, agile way to get you what you want, the most of what you want for whatever you have to spend. Because I promise you that if we were to say, uh, or if Shipple were to say, we can do 80% of that for your budget, and then somebody else comes along and says, I'm gonna do all of it for that budget because I really want that work, there is something strange going on there. Either they charge way too little and they don't know it, but then you get really lucky, but that doesn't really happen, or they're offshoring it, or they're lying, or they're stealing something, or something weird is going on. So this kind of harps on that, be aware of low bids because you might not be getting the work that you're paying for. And I get this almost weekly, someone calling saying, you know, we spent $2,000 on this website, but we're not being found in the search engines. I don't know how to work it. You know, we've had this same picture of a stock photography who is supposed to be our CEO on the homepage. We can't change it. And they have literally wasted $2,000 
that they could have invested in, in a real company with a real quote that would bring them you know, real business and knowledge. So beware of those low quotes. It's good to get a few, but. Yeah, usually things like, I've got a cousin. Uh, he's a computer science major at you know, whatever. Um, he works out of his garage. He, sa he said he could do it for 200 bucks. You know, you hear something like that as a vendor run, because <laughs> that means that this person doesn't know what they're talking about, and they think that people make websites in their garages for $200. They don't, unless they're a startup, and uh, that's happened, like, what, five times in human history? So, good luck. And this is just expanding on, you know, you want to have a relationship with that vendor, and is an RFP really going to get you to that point? You know, we're not sitting here saying, no, it will not. You're dumb for thinking that. Because it could, but you have to go into that process, whether you're going to do it or not, with the, with the fact that each side wants to establish a genuine, trustful relationship because everyone benefits if that's the case. And they don't. That's right. So uh, from, uh, from Giovanni, the, uh, the question is, uh, why would anybody spend a quarter of a million dollars without having something on paper that says what you're actually going to do? Right. So I, uh, that's a really good point. I'm glad you brought it up, because a lot of people, you're welcome. Thank you. You do, too. Uh, <laughs> We go way back. Um, so uh, there is a difference between writing a proposal or a quote or a bid and responding to an RFP. And what we don't want to do is respond to RFPs. We totally understand that putting down on paper at some point, this is what the projected budget is. We anticipate it'll cost roughly this much. That's all the paperwork that you have to have to engage in some kind of work. So that might be a master services agreement that includes a statement of work. That might be a series of emails where you agree on, on doing something. So the idea of like, do we bid work, meaning do we put together a bid all the time for every project, absolutely every project, totally unavoidable. And it's not a bad thing to do. It's actually very good because as vendors, thinking about how to quote out a project makes us think about the project in ways that reading an RFP or having a conversation might not achieve. So we start to think about the details and we start to come up with, oh, but what do they mean by that exactly? Do they want a payment processor or do they want to directly accept credit cards? Do we have to go with PayPal? Can we use authorize.net? All these little questions that come up. So coming up with um, proposal-like materials, meaning quotes, bids, statements of work, master service agreements, stuff like that, got to do it. It's going to happen. But it's the response to the RFP where it's sort of like kind of an open bid or a lot of people are bidding on it. That's the thing that doesn't get us anywhere. Make sense? Yeah. Cool. Thank you. You do too. Thank you. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> you do too. Thank you, Every, Todd. Everybody here <laughs> looks great today. Uh, right? <laughs> yes, it is. If it's not in writing, it doesn't exist. That's right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And there are some ways to deal with that um, built into how you project manage, such as uh, agile development like scrum methods, things like that, where you basically set the budget and say, we're going to do $10,000 worth of work. You decide what that work is, and we'll, you know, we'll play it by ear every two weeks to see how far we get. So there are ways that you can mitigate that as well. Also, you know, in line with the relationship, you're, it's almost, I think from a girl's point of view, if you've been cheated on, you're never going to trust a guy ever again. It's the same thing. You, you have to, to have a healthy relationship. So and we how many people here have had a bad vendor experience at some point, right? They happen. Were they the majority of experiences? Anybody? They were the minority, right? Like it happened a couple of times and you learned some lessons. 
That's typically the case. So don't let those spoil the whole bunch. And we only have five minutes here, so we're going to rush through these. Um, don't ask for free work. Just don't do it. Do not ask for prototypes, especially. Um, Proto that's part of, that's real work that we do. Right. Um, always pre-qualify your vendors. I think if you are going to make an RFP, you know, bring it down to maybe three companies that you've done research on and then send out the RFP because then you're getting genuine responses. It's almost like a referral. Someone told you they, this person did great work. Don't send it out for open bid. Well, that's the next point. Don't send it out for open bid. <laughs> Uh, obviously hyper communicate um, let us know I mean don't tell us not to contact you it's all about communication when you're bringing in new business anything Tom no sounds okay. good um, also tell us why you didn't choose us we want to know because it can only make us better um, if we wrote a horrible proposal I want to know that because that's going to make my next proposals that much better so we have thick skin we can take it tell us why you didn't choose us and remember we spent 30 to 40 hours or 10 to 20 hours or whatever it is too much time on that proposal we deserve some kind of an answer you know there were lower bids okay uh, we're not going to fight you ever. You know, that doesn't make sense. If you were to come back and say, well, you know, we, uh, we didn't like that you don't have much experience in whatever, and we go like, but we have plenty, you know, we're not gonna do that. We're adults, we're not gonna fight you. You've made your decision, it's done. What that tells us is, next time we need to emphasize that experience more. We're not doing a good job of communicating those things. So just as a favor, even if it's just a couple of sentences, even if it's a three minute phone call, whatever, Please respect the 10 to 40 hours that we spent putting together that document and just give us a little bit of feedback. So, questions? Portfolio work is, uh, and, and Ed Schiphol mentioned this earlier today, portfolio work is just that. It will never amount to anything else other than portfolio. And make sure you don't do it with a client that could potentially be very lucrative because they will, once you establish value of zero, that's how they will always value you. Anything more than zero, a dollar an hour, is going to be considered too much. Any more questions? We have two more minutes. Yeah. Well, at that point, that's just fraud. So, <laughs> but it's wrapped up in this whole world. Yeah. Yep. Yes, sir. Three years. I think it was after I'd spent months and months at answering a ton of RFPs. I got into this drive where I was searching them out myself. I, I was fairly new. It was in the first year of working at Shippel. And I just wanted to do work. I just I wanted to find new business. And being new, I, I thought that was an obvious route. So I'd find these RFPs, thought they were credible. But I got turned down over and over and over and over. And it really became a waste of my time and a waste of the company, company's time. Uh, so after that, I'm very picky. And Aaron, you know, my manager knows this. Sometimes RFPs that are brought into the office, I sit there and I question them. And people probably think I'm a B-I-T-C-H. But, I mean, it, it, it's my time that I have to give to this. So <laughs> did I spell that right? <laughs> All right. I think we'll... <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> all right, I, that, that's all of our time. So thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much.